Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. And my guest, Michael Lazar, has a passion for writing. His new novel, Eulogy, is about a man who thinks he knows his father. But what if that father kept secrets until the day he died? What would you do? The book is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the usual places. And for everything about Michael, go to michaellazar.com, and you can follow him on Facebook and Instagram. And Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ira. Thanks for letting me come on. Absolutely. So you write both fiction and nonfiction. What do you enjoy writing from both? Well, um, I'm really a fiction person. Um, I've tried to branch out a little bit into nonfiction now and then, but I've been um, writing fiction since college. And, um, you know, the story goes back to infancy. Um, my mother grew up in the Depression. She, she never finished high school, but she had a reverence for great writers. And our house was full of books. There's a story that I don't know if it's true, but there's a story that when I was in the baby carriage, my grandmother asked my mother what she wanted me to be when I grew up. And she said, a writer. And my grandmother said, you want him to be a bum? <laughs> so so um, anyway, the, the seed was kind of planted in my head. And um, when I got to college, I didn't really think about it much. It, it wasn't something that I thought I was going to do. But when I got to college, I loved literature. I became an English major. My first, I had a great professor my first semester. Um, and then the summer after my freshman year, I, I said, I woke up one day. It was like a religious vocation, you know, like a light from between the clouds came down. I, I said, I know what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to be a writer. I had no evidence that I had any talent for this, really, or <laughs> no reason to believe I could do it. But the funny thing is, you know, I started, I started taking creative writing classes that next semester and I never, I've never wavered or doubted or anything over the years of rejection and finally acceptances since then. It's just a strange thing. I, and I can only attribute it to that sense of growing up in a house full of books and, you know, seeing how much my mother loved them and, and, and loving literature myself too. So you decided to become a bum. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's a decision that you have to make when you get out of school, which is how are you going to earn a living? And a lot of people I knew got jobs in publishing, right, would be writers. And I felt that somehow um, it, it might just make it impossible for me to have the mental energy after work to keep writing. So I did everything but work in the, the industry of publishing or anything to do with writing. Um, I was a paralegal. I was a. I've, I've been all kinds of things, but I've tried not, you know, not to write for a living, so that I could keep writing books on the side. So there was that period of time where you were writing and you weren't yet succeeding, which translates into not enough revenue coming in. So I assume your family was patient with your progress because you really had a passion for writing. Um, you know. My well, my mother died when I was in college, so she didn't see any of this other than my initial like decision, which I guess that's a nice thing that she saw. My father was very practical, and you know he, he didn't want to be discouraging, but he couldn't. It was painful to him to see that I was going on a track where financially my life could be very unstable. He really wanted he he really wanted me to be an accountant, which. If he, you know, just thought for a minute about my skills in math, <laughs> he would have realized. Well, that's a form of fiction writing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, he, you know, he thought he, my brother-in-law was an accountant and, and you know, he said you can get a good job anywhere. Anyway, there wasn't not a prayer for that to happen. So I, you know, kind of he watched over the years as I struggled, but I always supported myself. I, you know, did this and that and, you know, had jobs and never I never went hungry. I just lived very simply. What did you realize you had made it in the sense that you could su support yourself for the rest of your life with your writing? Was it a particular book that was published? Was it an article? How was it? When, when, when did that moment come for you? I, I hate to disillusion you, but I don't, I think there are very few writers, including the ones who come on your show, who actually can support themselves with the books they write. Uh, and I'm not one of those. Uh, no, I've always, I've always had to do stuff. I, you know, I've taught, I've been, I've 
I have done some kinds of writing. I've done ghost writing and editing. To be honest, I still don't feel as successful as I want to be. But I think a lot of people feel that way. I've had many stories published. The, the first time I got a letter in the mail saying yes, after four years of sending out stories and getting only rejections was probably the most exciting moment of my life. And I screamed. My friend had a couple of friends there who witnessed this. And then many years went by of between that moment and getting my first novel published, that, that first story was accepted in fall of 1976. My first novel came out in 1999. So there was a lot of, um, I wrote stories in between and I wrote three novels that were not published. And finally things started to be accepted. Um, I think seeing, seeing books that you've written, you know, with your name on the cover in print an object that you can hold in your hand is a really significant moment. Um, so that, that, it's really important, I think, for every would-be writer to, to have that moment. I, I've talked to many writers, and I asked the standard question, which I'm trying to get out of asking, so I'm not going to ask you the question. But you introduced it in a way by the fact that you have a physical object that's there and is permanent. You know, you'll be gone, and the book is still there. I, I you know, that, I, you know, it, it sounds presumptuous to say it, but I, I feel that. You know, I, I know realistically unless I become somewhat more famous, there won't be a lot of people checking those books out of the library. But um, I do have that hope still. I still hope that the next thing I do will be you know, successful enough so people go back and, and look at the previous books. When you decided to write this novel, the current one, which is mm -hmm. called Eulogy, again, it's fiction, not nonfiction. So your passion is more for fiction, although there's one book you wrote of nonfiction, which you can talk about in a little while, but how did you develop the story and what kept you going about the story? What was it about eulogy and, and the discussion about a, a person not knowing the secrets of the father that intrigued you and, and propelled you forward? Well, I find every time I start a novel, I find that I have one initial concept that I'm working with and I try to develop that concept and it, it feels like it's not enough. It feels a little thin. And I wait and I, I just, I don't try to force it. I wait a little bit until other ideas kind of bubble up. And um, so this book is actually a combination of two very discrete concepts. One is the idea of an ordinary person doing something kind of heroic um, at fairly great risk to their own safety or security. Um, and that was just inspired by a few incidents, you know, that like there's a famous moment when the guy in the New York City subway system, a man passed out and another a train was coming. Another guy jumped down on the tracks to and covered the first guy. And I mean, which seems like a crazy thing to do, because I don't I didn't think there was room under a train for one person, let alone two. Right. But it turns out there is and they were both OK. But that, you know, I think everyone who heard that story wondered you know, what would I do in that situation? And, and I think, you know, realistically, very few would, would do what that guy did. But it made me think it, about writing about that impulse to, to be the ordinary person who does something kind of amazing. The other aspect of it is a son who has a kind of a maybe disappointed attitude towards his father, that his father always seems sort of small and ordinary, but who finds out something that he didn't know um so i combined those two and the father has this history that you would never have suspected um that he did this thing that was fairly brave ended up going to prison for it unjustly um and kept it a secret from his family from his kids because to him it was a shameful thing and he didn't want anyone to know about it um, and his siblings, the aunts and uncles, you know, honored his wish to not tell the kids. So the guy, the protagonist is in his 60s and he's delivering his father's eulogy, telling the father's whole life story, omitting this significant thing that later that night, his stepmother finds a box in the closet with um, all these mementos, including a sealed envelope with clippings about that court case that... Um, and she shows it to him. And he, so he discovers this thing. And the rest of the book is him trying to figure out what happened. Why did, why could, how is it possible that this kind of 
ordinary, hardworking, honest, nice guy, popular, friendly, could have gone to prison. So that's how that's how the two um, fit together. But your question really was, you know, what kind of kept me going? I, it's, you know, I, I find each day when I sit down to work, there's a certain, you know, like, oh, I have to go sit down and do this now. I have to concentrate. I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather do something else. But once, once I'm there and sitting, the process of creating new details and stories and sentences gets me excited and um, and I enjoy it. Um, and sometimes, you know, often it's like really, you know, like pushing a rock up a hill, but sometimes a real flow develops. And I, I remember there was this one moment, it was really kind of an amazing moment where I just writing, 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 and my brain sort of separated and part of me went above me and was looking down at me writing. And, and that part of me was saying, wow, look at him go. <laughs> you know, it was like, <laughs> I just, it was just coming out. Boom, 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 boom. How much did you rely on your own experience? Because I noticed in the background you have what appears to be medals from your father. Was that part of the inspiration for the novel? Well, um, the story of the novel is completely fictional. The, my father didn't go to prison, didn't do these things. But, um, and, and the personality of the fictional father is very different from mine. The, the, the fictional father is a very gregarious, sociable guy. He has a lot of friends. He's very popular. My father was could be charming, but he was kind of misanthropic, you know, and, and solitary. He, he didn't like, he hated going out to parties. My mother liked to socialize and he just couldn't stand it. So um, they're not at all alike. However, my father had a very interesting life and I borrowed many specific details, very interesting, odd details from his life, including the fact that... Um, he was in World War II in Italy and he was shot um, he, in the lung and um, it took 24 hours for them to find him. While he was there bleeding, German soldiers came and took his watch and ring and he had to play dead. He had to hold his breath for as long as they were there. And I, I used that story because I felt that for a couple of reasons, one, I couldn't have made up anything as good as that. Um, but I also wanted to memorialize my father. I, you know, earlier you talked about how there's a sense of a, a physical book is somehow almost immortal. And that felt that was a bit of my motive. I wanted to put this story, my, some of my father's stories into a form that would last for years and years. Another odd aspect of my father's life that I used in the book is our family is Jewish, but my father for a long time made a living making rosaries. Um, it started when he was 16. He got a job in this place in downtown Manhattan near the Woolworth building, and they trained him to make rosaries. And, you know, his, his family was super poor, and they, they said, you got to get a job. And he got this job, and he did mm -hmm. it even through my childhood, part-time. He would go there like two or three days a week in the mornings, and then at night he went to work at the post office. Um so I use those details and um, those medals that's like a purple heart and various things of my father's. Do you think your father would enjoy being part of the novel in an indirect way? Um, I don't know. I don't think I would have written it while he was alive. Um, just, just because it would feel like an invasion of privacy, um, I think. I don't know. I really, it's very hard to know what he would have thought of it. In a way, it's an indirect tribute to him. That's why I asked the question. I mean, from my yeah, point. no, ab obviously that's true. Um, but he might have felt like, well, this guy is nothing like me, so I'm not sure if it's a tribute. <laughs> um, but, but on the other hand, I hope that he would have felt like happy that he was able to help me in my career. Now, there are some novels that are 300, 400, 500 pages. Some you look at War and Peace, for example. Uh, but yours in this particular one, again, called Eulogy, is not overly large or overly thick or overly big. Uh, I don't know how many pages it totally is. I didn't bother looking, uh, and I should have. But how many pages is the book? It's about 140 pages. And, and it, you know, it almost it verges on the length of a novella. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting question, the thing that you're pointing out, because other books I've written have been much longer. I just found when I told the story that the story was over and I, and I thought, 
gee, that's kind of short, but I'm not going to pad it. I'm not going to like throw stuff in to make it longer. Right. It was a natural ending, in other words. Right. And yeah. and it's it's fairly dense. I mean, there's a lot in it. Um, I'm surprised sometimes at how much variety there is in that 140 pages. There's a lot of different people and scenes. In fact, the first chapter is so it's the funeral and um, the eulogy and at his house, the father's home afterwards and, the, you know, the people coming back to the house. There's so many characters introduced that it's actually, you know, I have to say, you know, I admit it could be a little confusing. Hopefully people get past that. Um, but it's a it's a very slim book. On the other hand, that's a selling point. You know, people are impatient and <laughs> yeah, attention span uh, of people these days. It's, right. Uh, it's a little tricky. Do you find that there is a market for fiction and novels in the sense that uh, book clubs will want you to talk to them or you can have gatherings where people want to hear from you about how you came up with the story and how you wrote the book, et cetera? Um, that has been the main way that I have publicized the book. I, I've reached out to various um, book groups um, through friends and, and libraries and um, around the country, and I've done it in person and on Zoom. And it's actually, it's terrific because it's a very solitary career. You know, I spend most of most days just sitting in my chair over there um, and, and working on these books. And then to go out in public, it's kind of, I feel like kind of I'm blinking in the light, you know, coming out from my cave. Right. And, um, and you know, you never know. I, mean, I, I guess, you know, when an author visits a book club, if somebody didn't like the book, they're reluctant to say that, you know, they're not going to. So nobody has actually said they didn't like it. I've had many very enthusiastic responses which is gratifying you know um it's it's a nice thing to hear interestingly people see things that are not what necessarily the main thing i was focused on but i wouldn't say they were wrong you know to find meaning in that um that has happened with all of my books no readers, readers tend to latch on to something in a book that is significant to them personally, even if it wasn't the author's main intent. Do you find that, well, I guess in a way, you're a combination of your mother and father. You're your father when you're sitting alone at that desk behind you, writing, and then you're socializing as your mother did. What you said happens to be very insightful beyond what you were talking about, about the book writing versus book clubs. Um, I take a lot from each of my parents. My my father was very disciplined. His his family background was German Jews, and, and you know he he was very you know you do everything you have to do. You're on time. Blah blah. blah all discipline. My mother was very dreamy and idealistic and un very unpragmatic. Um, and that's a strange combination, but it's kind of worked for me. I mean, the <laughs> the creative side is my mother and the sitting down and doing the work is my father. Right. But do you ever get when you're writing and you get lost in the writing process, do you feel lowly at times or are you so into it that that doesn't become an issue? Um, that's interesting. I, I never thought of it. The answer is I've, I've never felt lonely while I was working. I have felt lonely at other times, but, but right. not, not while writing. That was, you know, that's, it, it's, Sometimes I'm distracted um, and I kind of have a hard time concentrating, but then I sort of like say, okay, get back to it. Um, but no, loneliness is only when you wish you had somebody to hang out with, you know, when you're, I'm married now for many years, but I remember those years between grad oh, so, school. And oh, so you are life. lonely then. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? That was a joke. <laughs> no, no, edit that out. <laughs> It's only by the way, I want to just point out in your background are everything bagels. And Correct. it wasn't intentional, but the lunch that I just finished was an everything bagel. Oh, excellent. Well, good. <laughs> and I think, isn't it in the novel somewhere too, buried in the. Oh, uh... You know, I, I think I told you that everything that bagels appear in my novel, but I, I went to actually check. I wanted to make sure I was telling the truth. Right. And I think that, <laughs> let me explain. There's the scene after the funeral where people come back to the house and there are platters of food like lox and um, watermelon and things like that. And then then there's another scene after the unveiling near the end of the book where um, people come back to the house again. And I thought bagels were mentioned, but 
the bagels are only implied. <laughs> ah, well, that's another thing. There's everything bagel, and then there's implied bagels. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, that works. Do you set a schedule for yourself uh, on your father's side when you're sitting down to write each day? Do you set aside an hour a day, two hours a day, three hours a day? How does that work for you? Um, I have a, a fairly um, rigorous schedule. What I, The first hour of every day after breakfast, the first one hour, I force myself to sit in the chair for that one hour. It's hard concentration. And I find that it usually, you know, it's hard to keep up the most, the highest level of concentration for longer than that. Then I'll try to, I'll try to break it up with um, tasks that don't require as much concentration. And I'll try to get three hours in divided of fiction writing, divided by chores, exercise, music, um, and, I usually am writing something else too, like an essay or something like that. So it's so, not a solid three hours. It's it's three hours total, but it's broken up by yes. uh, feeding the cat and uh, making breakfast and making the bed. Yeah, I, I have a, a good friend who um, is a, she, she is a long distance runner. I was always a sprinter and that's how we write. I, I can only write in these like concentrated bursts Mm -hmm. She can sit for hours and hours, and I don't. I don't understand how she can do it, but it's, we're very different temperaments. Well, she probably doesn't understand how you do it either. <laughs> yeah, she probably yeah. thinks, "What's the matter with him? He's stopping after an hour." <laughs> no, I know how that feels because sometimes when I'm writing, I will think, and I'm usually writing humor, so I'm thinking of the funny concepts, which I'll write down first, and then construct the narrative based on the funny concepts. So it's a, it's in a way it's a reverse kind of thing. So I'm always interested in how writers pursue their I don't want to use the word process, but how how they write in essence. I, I, are have you ever tried writing standing up as opposed to sitting down? Wouldn't that be in a way different and get you a little bit more exercise? I've heard that that Hemingway did that as a as a way to force himself to be more focused. Like if you're sitting in a chair, you might nod out. And I've thought of doing it but i I've, I've never tried it i've never set up a spot where i could do it i never wanted to i'm lazy i like to sit in my chair <laughs> because you've been writing so long meaning so many years did you start out with a regular not to age you or anything but did you start out with a manual typewriter or an ibm selectric or anything like that yeah um i'm trying to think of i think i had a manual typewriter in college, and I think my sit, my older sister gave me an electric portable um, for, as a graduation present, which I then took to grad school. And yeah, so I was using that electric typewriter until about 1984 when word processing came about. I was supporting myself as a temp word processor, and I would do I would do all the typing, sneaking it in while I was at offices <laughs> using their computers, and then. Eventually, I got my own computer and started using that. Do you think computers make it easier for creative people or harder for creative people? Well, I, I find it's a really interesting distinction. There, I will write everything but fiction on a computer. When I'm writing fiction, it, I notice that I type very fast um, because I did it professionally for a bunch of years. And I noticed that the facility of typing fast means it's a little too glib the, the product is is a little thin when i so when i write fiction i'm always writing on lined paper with a pen and before i get to the period in the sentence i've usually changed 10 things in the sentence there are cross outs arrows or whatever um i find it's a very different mechanism of thinking and i can't really explain it beyond that but i think you get the idea that you know Typing is great for memos, emails, um, and I, I'll outline things on the computer too, but when it comes to actually writing a, sentences for a book, I have to do it longhand. So after you're done writing by hand, though, do you then have someone else turn it into typed pages or, or you know, put it into the computer? How does that work? Or do you do it yourself? Because it sounds like an extra work. You're writing by hand and now you're typing it into the computer. Um, I do that myself at night when I'm tired and can't concentrate anymore. Uh, it's a good way to use the time, but it's not, it's not, um, what would you call it? Mindless labor. I usually edit somewhat what I've written before as I'm typing. So it's useful. 
Before I let you go, what's your next project beyond, of course, Eulogy, which is your new novel? What's your next project? Well, um, I'm working on a novel now that is set in the future. Um, it's political. It's sort of imagining i'm i'm fairly to the left and it's imagining a world in which the conservatives have been in power for a while um, and have gotten achieved many of their goals but it's focused on four teenagers it's not a young adult novel but it's about four kids in high school 20 years from now who are dealing with this world where there are a lot more restrictions um and the way they both make their way around those things and get caught in traps that they didn't expect to get caught in. And I should not let you go before you mention your nonfiction book that you just recently. May, may I hold it up? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, hold on. Our Here. listeners, our listeners won't uh, see it, but I'll I'll let this part out. So go ahead. Okay, this is a this is the advanced copy that happens to be handy. It's called the Word Lovers Lexicon, and this little the illustrations are vintage engravings this this is actually a, an engraving of kaiser wilhelm from like <laughs> 1917 but the caption that you can't see says you would like to know what my helmet is called yes <laughs> <laughs> and on the back it explains says i see you are impressed by my pickle halber and how could it be otherwise <laughs> um because the pickle halber is the name for that helmet with the point on it right exactly so well, that, let me let me try to briefly explain what this is um we have a about a minute left go ahead okay when i got out of grad school and set out to become a writer i was reading great books um joyce faulkner pynchon um nabokov nabokov however you say that and i noticed there were an awful lot of words that i didn't know and i thought well if i want to be a writer i should know the words so I started looking them up. I started making lists. And then a few years later, I gathered them in, and organized them by category. And this is it's many years later. I've been gathering these words since 1977. They're quotations from literature and journalism. Some are hundreds of years old. Some are from last year. Um, and it's a fun book. It's, a, it's, it's kind of, I had a great time putting it together. And I think it's fun to browse in. Well, that's a great way to leave it, my guest. Michael Lazar has a passion for writing. His new novel, Eulogy, is about a man who thinks he knows his father. But what if that father kept secrets until the day he died? What would you do? The book is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the usual places. For everything about Michael, go to michaellazar.com, and you can follow him on Facebook and Instagram. And Michael, thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much, Sarah. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.